Why the populist dialogues? Populism was a product of an economic system which drove the American people into either greater wealth or abject poverty. From 1873 until 1893, America experienced a devastating economic crisis characterized by falling farm prices and massive urban unemployment. As the poor cotton farmers of East Texas and the South searched for a way out of their poverty, they identified the source of their conditions as the railroads and the East Coast banks. The farmers began to develop a system of farming co-ops and banking mechanisms independent of these powerful institutions. While creating the new systems, the populists advocated for structural changes to the political system. They realized that neither two political parties, Republicans in the North and Democrats in the South, serve them. The two parties were entrenched with the railroads and the banks. A third party was needed that united black, white, and red, as well as urban factory workers with rural farmers. Thus the People's Party, known as the Populists, were born. Our program is called the Populist Dialogues because we identified with these early populists, the principal cause of today's economic, social, environmental, and political problems is the corporate takeover of our democracy. Corporate dominance has eliminated most of our democratic institutions. Most importantly, the American people's active participation in our decision-making processes. Our program's purpose is to inform our audience of the current populist solutions to these problems. We promote true populist ideas and ideals, unlike phony populists who identify government as the source of their oppression and use wedge issues to divide the poor, working class, and the middle class. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. My name is David Delk and I host this series of half-hour weekly cable public access programs produced here at the studios of Portland Community Media in Portland, Oregon. The Alliance for Democracy is a grassroots organization dedicated to creating true democracy and creating a society based on an equitable sustainable economy as well as ending corporate domination. If you're interested in these values and these values resonate with you, please visit either our national web at thealliancefordemocracy.org or our Portland website at www.afd-pdx.org. Uh, today our guest is Dr. Sahir Wahab. Uh, he is a professor of education at Lewis and Clark College in their graduate school of education and counseling. Uh, he has master's degrees in compar com comparative education as well as oh, international development education, which uh, 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 his PhD is, is in that from Stanford. He is a native of Afghanistan, to which he frequently returns, spending about four months there each year. And he has served as senior advisor to the Minister of Higher Education in Afghanistan from 2002 to 2006. So welcome to the show. Thank you, David, yeah. for having me. It's yes, good to be a, with it's, you. Our, it's our pleasure. So, I looked at your website, and you have a personal uh, statement on your on your website, and it says, "A new and different education could enable us to redirect or arrest our collective march toward the abyss." Can you just give us what what yeah. did you mean by that? Well, I didn't really mean to be uh, melodramatic, uh, David. Uh, over the years, uh, I have traveled quite a bit in the, what, would, what would be called the, the old world, the new world, uh, the third world, even the fourth world. Uh, you know, I have been to almost every continent except Australia. Mm. Uh, and as you pointed out, for the last 10 years, I have been going to Afghanistan every year. Um, uh, I just returned, you know, uh, last mid-June. So I uh, sort of bring a, a different perspective uh, on issues. Uh, 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 whether it's uh, economics, politics, uh, the environment, and so forth. Uh, and over the years, uh, uh, through my travels and studies, and especially the last 10 years, uh, going back and forth between Afghanistan and uh, the United States here, uh, I have seen quite a bit of uh, misery, uh, to say the least. 
Uh, I mean, I really strongly believe that uh, humanity as a whole uh, is uh, sort of on the brink. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we're going to have seven billion people in October. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, already we know that there are water shortages, uh, there are food shortages, uh, you know, cities are becoming unlivable. Uh, too many people, and then there's also a question of maldistribution and malconsumption, especially by the first world or the developed world. Uh, you know, there are there's massive uh, hunger and poverty. Uh, uh, people, our uh, viewers know that uh, maybe two million billion people live on a dollar or two dollars a day. I know people in Afghanistan. I work with them. People who actually live on a dollar or two dollars a day. I know people who have trading enough drinking water. Uh, uh, I know people um, whose half ch of their children, uh, you know, die before they're uh, reaching uh, the age of five. We have uh, global warming. Uh, we have uh, climate change. We have these nuclear accidents. Uh, mm -hmm. We're having uh, droughts and floods at the same time. Afghanistan is experiencing a very serious drought now uh, in many uh, provinces. Uh, and we have these wars and violence and uh, c crime and criminality and the gangsterization of, uh, of uh, societies, wholesale societies. And we have governments, uh, Democrat, quasi-Democrat or dictatorial, uh, who um, seem to be out of control. Mm -hmm. So uh, from my perspective, uh, we are collectively, uh, this country, Afghanistan, and I would say humanity at large really are facing some very serious issues uh, and unless there is sort of a paradigm shift in our mindset collective mindset uh, which can be done through education I really do think that we are going to um, be facing some serious c catastrophe mm -hmm. okay yeah and, and I agree and you uh, you're talking about the uh, the droughts and the heat and and all that we've experienced just in the in the past summer and, yes. and last year with all the flooding just in the United States if you know, it seems like people should be waking up to the fact that the world is changing dramatically you would hope uh, we would hope so right and of course then the question always is then when people do wake up then how do people affect change well, uh, people will not wake up, uh, so to speak, uh, because I, uh, I do believe that mainstream education, even in the United States, which has some, of, you know, one of the best uh, education systems in the world, uh, but uh, given these the, the magnitude and the widespread nature of these crises that we're facing, I mean, in this country, you know, we have uh, uh, poverty, we have unemployment, uh, underemployment, uh, we have. Uh, crime and criminality, we have, uh, you know, problems, environmental problems, uh, uh, we have, you know, a, a government which seems to be out of control, sort of the, the militarization of our mm -hmm. culture and the militarization of our foreign policy. Uh, I mean, all of these things are happening and quite a few people sort of are aware of, I think, in one way or another, either through the mainstream media, uh, which um, uh, I would say uh, has failed, uh, but also mainstream education. Uh, so I don't have a lot of faith in mainstream education uh, and or uh, the mainstream media apparatus or the political dialogue to really redirect people and to genuinely inform people in such a way so that people would feel uh, informed, uh, empowered mm -hmm. to, to redirect their own lives or to redirect the, the life of their, the country or our major institutions. We need uh, an education system top to bottom that would be, um, that would teach people critical analytical skills that would not only inform the mind but also the heart and the soul. Mm -hmm. And that would bring people together and give people a sense of empowerment but also give individuals and collectives a sense of ownership in a sense of ethical responsibility, in a sense of stewardship uh, of the society, the planet and uh, other countries. Mm -hmm. uh, we need a new kind of uh, education, the existing education um, is is ineffective in my view. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you see Do you see any movements toward a new education? It seems like you know we keep education educates to the test. Yes. And yeah, not toward critical thinking. Yes. And it, it would appear that in spite of 
uh, you know, I, I think that when Obama was running, there was some hope that he yes. might redirect that. I haven't seen that. Um, unfortunately, not. Uh, you know, the education in this country uh, is sort of like a contested terrain. Uh, you know, there are really uh, sort of intense struggles over the the direction of education, the the goals of education, the content, the methods, and so and so forth. Uh, you know, uh, there are conservatives. Uh, and then there are liberals, and then there is, you know, a left critical education movement. Uh, but essentially, as you well know, um, uh, education from preschool all the way through graduate school uh, is pretty much informed by uh, the elite in society mm -hmm. and uh, by um, uh, sort of the, the corporations who want uh, workers and consumers more than good citizens. Uh, I would say that both the conservatives and the liberals uh, really continue the, the educational machinery and try to bring it uh, in more in alignment with the political economy. Uh, and so, but there is a, a school of thought, uh, critical theorists, and you see them in schools, among school teachers, writers, uh, you know, academics, and so forth, who really believe that um, continuing the same education system, um, uh, you know, with the same kind of very technical, narrow goals and objectives, and mm -hmm. a heavy emphasis on tests and uh, a very narrow definition of accountability and. Uh, you know, and judging student teachers on the basis of the scores of the children, all of these people are uh, are mistaken. But there is a school of thought which say that we need to th rethink education. Uh, it's it, our vision of society, our vision of education, our particular goals for education, uh, the curriculum, the pedagogy, the assessment, and uh, what we want out of this education. Uh, those marginal forces call them critical theorists, um, they're not a movement, but they certainly are one of the voices that is, uh, is slowly being heard uh, because, because there is such a dissatisfaction with mainstream education. And in particular, uh, unfortunately, that President Obama really uh, is not doing very much uh, anything new. Uh, he essentially is continuing uh, the policies uh, of the previous uh, president, whether we talk about education or foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, I, I know here in Portland that the Bill Gates Foundation has spent yeah. a lot of money in yeah. revamping some of our schools, and uh, I know that uh, there's been a lot of hope mm -hmm. that those kinds of things would produce uh, yeah. better students, better achievement, more yeah. children yeah. graduating from high school. Yeah. Uh, I look at it, however, as being a an effort to get a corporate control over schools. Your reaction? Precisely. Yes, uh, I would agree. I mean, I think uh, uh, one of the problems uh, when it comes to education in this country is that uh, edu professional educators themselves are not consulted very much or heard, uh, and so you get politicians who did go to school, of course, or you have people. Uh, like uh, Bill Gates and uh, other people, uh, you know, who uh, who actually did not quite finish schooling, but make it their business to talk about uh, education, which is a very uh, complicated, uh, you know, and very central issue to our lives as individuals and as a nation. Uh, what I would like the corporation, of course, the corporations uh, would like to sort of uh, run the education system because they're not very happy with uh, the way things are going, um, mm -hmm. but also I think the corporations are um, scapegoating education. If there's an unemployment and underemployment, that's not because education has failed, that, but that's because the corporations are at the same time exporting jobs and importing labor. Mm -hmm. From cotton, you know, from people who pick strawberries to IT workers from India and so forth. So I would like for um, the corporate sector uh, to simply mind their own business, pay their fair share of taxes, and leave education to professional educators and citizens um, to run the education mm -hmm. system. I, I, I like that program a lot. <laughs> I think that's very good advice to corporations. Uh, unfortunately, they're probably not going to be listening, and they're going to well, continue meddling. They should. <laughs> right. uh, well, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yes. Yeah. You described uh, your ideal of, of college education, and your description sounded like uh, well, you said about uh, that currently we um, educate people to fill functions. Yeah. And what 
what I was hearing while you were describing that is the opposite of that is what we used to call a traditional liberal education. Yes. Which yes. because we have all, you know so many college students now are going either into technical yes, uh, or colleges business, or, uh, or into the business realm yes. to learn marketing. Right. Uh, uh, that the idea of has been yeah. lost. Uh, unfortunately, again, you know that's because uh, uh, the uh, the corporate sector has been so effective. Uh, in sort of shaping education. Uh, and so the idea of a good education now is for people with certain kinds of skills and habits and so forth. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, there's not much attention being paid to what I call liberal arts. I do believe in uh, the idea of liberal arts uh, beginning with preschool all the way through graduate school. That is to say, I do believe that people, no matter what line of work they choose, what they study, and wh how they plan to live their lives and what to do, I think we also need a very well-educated, thoughtful, analytical, critical, responsible, ethical um, citizens and, and people. Uh, and uh, technical education simply sort of marginalizes uh, liberal arts. That is to say, um, some humanities, philosophy, for example, sociology, uh, anthropology and uh, uh, in literature uh, because uh, uh, in people should be able to study what interests them and do for work uh, whatever interests them but we also need good citizens thoughtful mm -hmm. uh, and not just national citizens but also global citizens and uh, the feeling is that a good solid broad comprehensive liberal arts education uh, can contribute to producing good uh, global citizens. Mm -hmm. And so I believe in that. Um, uh, but, the, the, you know, the corporations are uh, disingenuous, I think, uh, because uh, it has been said. Uh, the corporate world, of course, would say uh, education has failed the economy and failed the, the nation. And the response to that is that the vast majority of the jobs, as you well know, are really service jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has been said that the majority of Americans are overschooled for the kind of work that is available and the work they do. Mm -hmm. So if that is the case, uh, then I think it behooves us to dwell on the, the liberal arts c component of education to produce uh, good people. Um, uh, I think we need to put the blame where it is, and that is the private sector not investing uh, in America and Americans or in American education. If they want good workers, they should invest in the production of good workers, and they should refrain from outsourcing jobs to other countries mm -hmm. and importing workers at the same time. Mm -hmm. I, I, I totally agree. And I, I think one of, the, one of the charts I recently saw showed uh, that over the past, I'm going to say 20 years, I can't quite remember what the time yeah. frame was, but that the job, the jobs in the United States that were created were minuscule and the jobs which were created overseas yes. by American companies yes. were going up like this as, as, they, yeah. as they were cutting the jobs in the United yeah. States. So uh, that, that's not... Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, I think most people know that we are exporting jobs and production but and importing. There are, you know, about half a million special visas issued every year by the federal government mm -hmm. to bring people in the technology field to this country from India, Ukraine, and, and other countries. And the question uh, before me is uh, why not invest in America and in Americans? Uh, and why not have this production be at home here so that people can have work, employment, keep their homes, you know, have health care, have decent livable wages, uh, you know, and, uh, and have a certain amount of leisure so that they can read and think and, you know, worry about mm -hmm. the kind of society mm -hmm. and the kind of world we live in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, w it would appear to me that those who rule in America have decided that we will have a permanent unemployment rate of officially around 10 percent, probably into the foreseeable future and that the unofficial rate will probably go up to 25 percent. Well, this is one of the, the crises the, that I, you know, think about, uh, you know, uh, this uh, economic um, recession verging on depression, you know, this cannot go on uh, without something happening in society. Mm -hmm. And I think those who are concerned with, say, social stability, democracy, and, uh, you know, um, uh, 
uh, you know, national well-being should pay attention to this uh, because uh, once you people are used to a certain way and standard of living, uh, and one, if you take that away from them, uh, you know, they will react. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if I were part of the ruling elite in this society or part of the corporate world, I would be thinking about um, uh, possible uprisings and instability. And so, but also I think uh, every American has contributed to making America what it is, and everyone is also entitled to a piece of the, the products and the fruits of uh, what people have made together. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's very distressing uh, to me. It's almost criminal, really, to impose uh, unemployment, economic distress, underemployment, poverty, or lack of, uh, you know, health care or uh, lack of good education, et cetera, on people. Uh, that's that's that should be considered un-American mm -hmm. and anti-American. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'm not sure because the uh, clock got uh, covered up. I don't know how much time we have left. Uh, yeah. We were going to talk about Afghanistan, yes. so I, I, th I think that we'll have you come back for another half hour program so we can actually That'll focus on we that. We can go on with uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Um, do you see? Do you see any movements? You know, we've we've just gone through. Uh, probably by the time that this program airs, we have we'll have gone through this whole debate about raising the ceiling or not raising the ceiling, and we'll know the outcome of that. Do you see any? Uh, hope on the horizon that we would uh, be moving forward in a more progressive manner at, at the national level, particularly? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, uh, although uh, if you look at American society, it looks like no one cares doing anything, but uh, my sense is that there's a tremendous amount of unhappiness. Like this morning, people who listen to NPR, for example, uh, President Obama's approval rating is under 40. Uh, mm. Congress is 18 <laughs> percent. Uh, okay. You know, I mean, uh, the average, I think, uh, you know, because this depression recession uh, has gone on for too long. And, and we all know, for example, that uh, there are a lot of Americans, tens of millions of Americans, who are hurting. Mm -hmm. You know, people have lost their homes, they have lost their work, they have lost their job security, they have lost their health care, you know, they, they've lost their savings, uh, you know, and their children are not getting a very good education. Uh, people are under tremendous uh, pressure. Uh, and I think there's, there's a lot of the, the unhappiness uh, is one indication, but also I know a lot of people, young people in particular, are organizing around different issues. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people concerned with, uh, uh, you know, the environment or foreign policy or war or unemployment or underemployment or the very systematic uh, uh, assault on workers and workers' unions. Uh, you know, we saw this in uh, Wisconsin and uh, in other states. So, uh, you know, so I think the, the unhappiness is there, and I think there are people who are organizing, uh, you know, the movement hasn't yet been formed because uh, the public, the, the mass media, uh, refuse to sort of cover these mm -hmm. uh, act, uh, activities by different Americans. But and one never quite knows, you know. I mean, uh, we, no one would have predicted what is happening in the Arab world, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, things could uh, have something like that could happen here mm -hmm. without anyone really planning or without uh, heroes and heroines mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, if conditions continue to uh, deteriorate and if the ruling elite in this society continues to be indifferent and cruel and heartless, uh, you know, uh, we shouldn't be surprised if there's just a, a spontaneous, massive uprising and sort of the American Intifada mm -hmm. or the American Spring. Mm -hmm. uh, I have hope, uh, and people have a reason, because this is a very rich country. The, there's no reason for anyone to go without uh, in this society, mm -hmm. especially when we know that there's, you know, the wealthy is getting wealthier and the poorer and the middle class are getting poorer. People can see that, they can sense that, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't think this will go on. Yeah, I, I, or should I think, go on. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think that at some point it is going to explode because people do realize what's happening. Yeah. Right now, they're not finding an outlet to express that, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, right. that's the so. fault of, again, I think of the political process, the political discourse, as you know, has been really poor, mm -hmm. um, substandard, and an insult to our minds, collective mind and conscience. Uh, the education system uh, simply turns in, you know, cogs for the machinery, and uh, the mass media are not interested in covering activism because they have learned their lessons too. Yes, uh, uh, from the 60s, you know, and uh, and on. So, 
uh, but you know people will not wait uh, for permission or will not wait for uh, the mass media to cover it. I, I know people are entitled again uh, to have a decent life because mm -hmm. this country can afford it and it's morally obligated to provide it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I liked uh, I, I liked Huey Long's slogan when yeah. he was running against President yeah. Roosevelt, which pushed Roosevelt yeah. to do uh -huh. a lot of the things that he eventually did, which yeah. was share the wealth. Yes, yes. Share the wealth. Yes, uh, we, I mean, we do have the wealth. again, uh, you know, the, this is everybody's country. Uh, we all own a piece of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, no one should go without uh, the basic needs in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll That's see. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, I, I'm really disappointed because when I was uh, a child growing up here in Portland, yeah. uh, we were very poor. You know, I really did believe what I heard, you know, what I read in school, what I what I heard in the textbooks, which was the generally everything in America gets better all the time. You know, unfortunately, yeah, yeah. we've we've gone backwards. Uh, it seems. Right. It seems. I mean, you know, a class of people, as you well know, um, is doing very, very well. Mm -hmm. uh, unbelievable. Again, the concentration of wealth uh, in, you know, 10% owning 90% of the country, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but uh, the 90% uh, people are struggling. Even middle class people with jobs, you know. Uh, because the, of the cost of living, uh, you know, because of unpredictable things happening, uh, and also I think just the anxiety and secure insecurity around unemployment and mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, people losing their work. Uh, there's a, a lot of anxiety, mm -hmm. and it's sort of it's that's also apparent right. uh, in uh, you know drug abuse, uh, alcoholism, uh, people behaving very strangely. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's the elite should be held responsible. Mm -hmm. Great. Good. Well, our half hour is up. I thank okay, you very well, much for being you. here. We never got to the topic, thank so uh, we uh, hopefully you're agreeable to coming back, uh, and uh, we'll uh, broadcast again with yeah. you again next week, and we'll talk about our actual topic, which we'll was be Afghanistan. We'll be, we'll, I will be happy to. Okay. And there are connections to be made between the deprivation in America and the occupation in Afghanistan. I right. think people need to make that connection. Absolutely, and we'll do that in yeah. the next in the next half hour. So uh, we are. Finished for today. I want to thank our crew today. Our crew uh, was Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Janice Morris, and Tom Thomas. We wouldn't be on the air without them. So thank you very much for being here. And thank our audience for being here. And I hope you'll join us again next week. <laughs>